So I, I guess I'll, I'll get started right away. So what, so what, if anything, have you heard from boots on the ground about companies like Waymo, about companies like Tesla that are looking to enter sort of this driverless um, thing, right? Is there fear? Yeah. Is there doubt? Is there an embrace? Like, are people embracing it? Are people doubting it? Just give me a high yeah. level sort of like, well, where, I mean, where's I the think- vibe? Yeah, I mean, really at a high level, I mean, since Waymo started offering driver, I mean, they've been doing it in Phoenix, uh, in Arizona for a while, but really since they launched in Los Angeles, you know, six, nine months ago, San Francisco, 12 months ago, I think that was kind of the big inflection point, because I think with a lot of these like new, exciting industries, you know, you're, it's always like, talking about what's going to happen, right? Obviously, Tesla fans, you know, are very, you know, Elon often ends up delivering, right? But timelines are delayed or, you know, things happen. Um, But I think that, like, for me, that was the big inflection point. Waymo, you can go call a Waymo in LA, San Francisco, Phoenix, Austin, Atlanta coming soon, right? And you can literally be in the back of a driverless vehicle that's going to take you from A to B. And so I think that inflection point really unleashed, you know, Waymo ended up raising $5 billion, which doesn't help, you know, right after that. But I think that inflection point really kind of crystallized it for a lot of people, you know, for Uber drivers specifically, for example, like they're not big fans of AVs, you know, to be honest, like they hate them, right? Because they're driving and now you have robo competition, right? And so it's hard to not say that, hey, more drivers is a bad thing, right? More robo drivers, obviously there's, you know, no one wants their job taken and really no one wants it taken by a robot. That doesn't feel good. So I think that's kind of the stage that we're at. And then of course with Tesla, you know, I know your audience are obviously huge Tesla fans. I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching right now have used full self-driving. It's an amazing product. I'm thinking about getting a new car right now. And it's like, I don't know if I can get a non-Tesla because that FSD is so damn good. Like I've been thinking about a Rivian and I, I love the look of the Rivian SUV, but it's like, I don't know how their, you know, whatever their FSD wannabe product is, gonna, <laughs> you know, be. Um, and I really have gotten used to it. And so, you know, I personally, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Like, I personally feel that, you know, I, I wouldn't get in the back of a Tesla, you know, at least my Tesla with full self-driving just yet, but obviously they're pretty close. And, you know, Waymo, um, you know, is out there giving rides 250,000 trips per week. Uh, it's still small though, relative to Uber. I think a lot of people forget that Uber, uh, far as that, if you don't mind, I'll question you, uh, how many, how many trips do you think yeah. Uber does, uh, in a single day uh, around the world? Pff- Probably a thousand X Waymo, if I were to guess. Yeah, I don't so, know. So, I don't know about yeah. thousand X, but it's like eight, nine, ten million trips a day. So yeah, it's probably saying, you know, Waymo's doing two hundred fifty thousand trips a week. So this is my first meeting of the day. So I'm not even gonna attempt to do the math, but you can sort of see like, hey, wow, Waymo's big, they're growing, they've got a fleet of fifteen hundred vehicles, but it's still actually pretty small. Compa- I mean, very small compared to, you know, Uber's global and even Uber's U.S. footprint. So I don't know. I think it's kind of a really cool, exciting time, uh, lots of opportunity. And then, of course, obviously, when you throw Tesla into the mix, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, with honestly a very different business model uh, than Waymo as they approach the sort of robo taxi um, opportunities. I think that's kind of like those three companies, Uber, Waymo and Tesla are, you know, basically every headline every single week in my newsletter is one of those three companies because they're kind of the biggest, brightest and you know most exciting. So, so I guess let me pick your brain on this because I'll sort of tell you where, where my head is at. I'm sure you know where my head is at with this. And, and I'm really curious to see how you're viewing this and sort of test this thesis. So I, I really think that, you know, U- Uber has done this great service and this great product where they figured out how to fill drivers that have cars, that have time with people that are looking for a ride that they don't really have to deal with a taxi company. They can just pull up their phone and be like, I need to go to A from A to B and there are yeah. there is open bandwidth for people to go and be like, yo, okay, I can fill that that service for you. And they've created this much more uh, useful ecosystem versus calling your local taxi company yeah. and then nobody picking up and then trying a different taxi company. Nobody's picking up and then you get picked up in a dr- in a car where the car's beat up and the driver hates you, right? Yeah. It's like just they they've made that experience much much better. But I think in the land of self-driving cars, especially with companies that have the scale to put out multiple hundreds of thousands of them or potentially millions of them per year uh, at some point in the near future or even far future. But once that exists, it feels like companies like Uber or this ride share economy has a chance to be heavily disrupted because you're yanking the most quote unquote expensive part of the equation out of the equation, which is the driver's time. And then you're starting to offer the service that doesn't have a driver. So from my perspective, it feels like this is a this is a, a point in time where it, there's going to be some heavy disruption in rideshare. So I'm just curious to get your take on that. Do you think that's a fair take? I'd love to pick your brain on this. 
Yeah, I would say that there is the potential for heavy disruption, right? I think with Waymo, um, you know, probably I do, you know, because now Uber and Lyft and all these other companies are public companies. So we do a lot of investor calls, you know, people who have billions of dollars invested in these companies. They want to know what are drivers feeling? What are they saying? Probably my last 10 to 15 investor calls that I've done over the past year, they've all just been hijacked and people want to know about Waymo versus Uber, right? Because they're here, because they're now. And I actually think Waymo is less of a direct threat to Uber and we can get into the reasons why. Why? But it really has to do with the business model. Like I go back to Waymo has 1,500 cars. They just announced they're going to add another, you know, couple thousand by next year. Okay, cool. They'll be at 3,500 cars next year. <laughs> Lyft, for example, they actually own a fleet of 15,000 vehicles um, under their Flex Drive program. So actually, they're already one of the biggest owners of vehicles in the rideshare space. And just to put that right, like Waymo is going to have 3,500 by next year. Lyft literally already has 15,000. Like Lyft is tiny compared to Uber, right? So like they're still a fraction when you think about like that vehicle ownership, people forget like cars are expensive, man. 50,000 bucks for a car times, you know, a thousand, you know, a thousand cars, right? You really starts to add up $50 million fleet, right? Um, <laughs> um, or whatever the numbers are. And so I think that that kind of that business model difference is important to note. And then like, when you think about that's sort of where I've been most excited by Tesla, because they are going to approach it with a very different business model. And I think, you know, like you've talked about this, Elon has talked about this. Um, and I think he's obviously like probably rightfully so as the CEO, like very bullish on their uh, approach. I'm a little more skeptical. We can get into the reasons why, but you know, they've already got millions of cars on the road. Right. And so they can kind of, and potentially, get those vehicles on to the platform and actually like start to compete from a num you know have they have the potential to compete with uber when it comes to fleet size when it comes to you know like quality of the product experience right whereas waymo it's just going to take much longer for them to scale up right and so i think that's kind of like people really are like oh wow when's waymo going to kill uber i'm like i don't think waymo is going to kill uber anytime soon like tesla has the potential to kill or maybe not kill Uber, but, you know, really compete head to head with Uber. But it's because it's such a different business model, if that makes sense. Uh, Hans, you want to uh, jump in and. Yeah, I just was thinking about the <clears throat> the fleet size is obviously the biggest factor there that if you're, you know, you have a service, like you said, that's offering in the, you know, roughly 10 million rides a day service, then you've got to have that, you know at least hundreds of thousands of cars, you know, total in your network in order to do something like that. And, um, it's obvious even for Tesla, it's going to take some time to get to that level of scale. And it is something that when you think about that overall size, that the, you realize that Uber kind of does have some time to deal with, the entrance of what, you know, whether it's Tesla, whether it's someone else, obviously even more time, if it is someone like Waymo that moves a lot slower and is growing slower. Um, but that said, I think that once the, you know, once Tesla actually has those robo taxis that are operating to your point earlier about, you know, your investor calls where you're seeing people saying, Hey, you know, is Waymo going to kill Uber? Like that conversation will, quickly switch over once there is a commercial service that's available with Tesla to, oh no, is Tesla going to kill Uber? And I think that's going to yeah. be, you know, the hot topic for a lot of people who manage a lot of money very, very quickly. Definitely. Well, and let me also, you know, Farzad, you asked a good question about, you know, sort of Uber and like the innovation that they've really brought to the marketplace. Because obviously everyone knows Uber, they know Lyft, they open the app, they call a ride. And, you know, they, they don't always maybe understand though, like how that's happening with such reliability. Like when's the last time you opened the Uber app in the United States and couldn't have an Uber within five, seven by honestly five to seven minutes. Like maybe it's not for the price you want. Maybe it was really damn expensive, but it's always available no matter where you are, especially in the United States. Um, small, big, you know, city. And obviously there's some places, you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, it may not work or may not work nearly as well, but like any major city where all the rides happen, it's very reliable. And that's really Uber's number one KPI. Like the thing that they care most about is basically when you open the app, there's a car available and there's a five to seven minute ETA. I had a Lyft executive on my panel at a conference recently, uh, autonomous vehicle conference. And I asked him what 
do you know, do they even track that? And they literally don't even track reliability. Like there's always a car available. Like they don't even look at that anymore. They know that there's always a car available. What they now look at is like, what's the ETA three to five minutes is, you know, usually what they're targeting. Right. And the way that they do that is through surge pricing. And it's through what I call this variable fleet. Right. So I signed up to drive for Uber 11 years ago. Like I already owned a car. I own a car today. Right. When there's higher earnings potential, I would go onto the network and I would drive. As soon as I log off, I go home, I charge my car, you know, I clean my car, someone pukes in the back of my car, I handle that, right? Not ideal. Um, but you know, all these things that like cleaning, maintenance, you know, I get in an accident, I have to worry about that. Like Uber literally doesn't own a single fleet in their entire, they have six or 7 million drivers around the world. They don't own a single car in that fleet, not one, right? And so I think that sort of highlights, right? The fact that like, if they have that ability for like millions of people to bring them online, that variable supply, and then as soon as they go offline, they don't have to worry. They literally don't even have to, not even not pay for them. They don't even have to worry about them. Where do they park? Where do they charge? Like Waymo has a depot here in Los Angeles, right near SoFi Stadium where the LA Chargers play football. And it's like prime real estate. You know what I mean? Like I can only imagine like what it costs to put in, you know, install chargers and all that. And like the reason why they need that depot there is because the highest density of trips are in the core areas of Los Angeles, San Francisco. You can't go put a depot like out an hour away because then now all the Waymos have to go drive out there, lose charge, lose range, lose time, drive back, right? So your real estate costs are actually higher because you have that fleet and you have that charge, right? And so you can start to see this is where, you know, I think I'm, uh, you know, I think optimistic about Tesla's chances against uh, Uber, you know, with the big caveat, like if or when they launch, you know, kind of a, a self-driving um, platform, you know, kind of like a full, full <laughs> self-driving platform that would be capable of robo robo-taxi rides because a lot of those problems that Waymo has, like Tesla may not, they still have some, but they won't have a lot of the big ones. I think that the thing that's the most interesting thing to me about the Tesla approach, and you know, I, you mentioned that you, know, you do have some skepticism about some stuff, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But I think the the thing that I always get so like stuck on when I'm thinking about the landscape of self-driving is... Under under the assumption that Tesla does reach unsupervised robo taxi, so you know the, the the what we're hearing from the companies that in June in Austin here mm -hmm. we're gonna get yeah. the ten to twenty ones that can that can do it, okay? And with the assumption that that is successful, that that trial is successful, and they're able to successfully navigate a self driving mm -hmm. fleet of Teslas that don't require a driver within a, a region, okay? That all of a sudden that becomes a software update to millions of cars. And all of a sudden, you've turned on a a, a fleet a fleet size that's equivalent to one fourth to one fourth one third the size of Uber's entire global fleet just yeah. through the cars we've manufactured. Now, of course, there's regulatory that's there. There's making sure you have enough miles, safety miles there. It's just a time scale question versus yeah. like a capability of getting it out the door question. Well, so, and ahead, then also to his point, the additional infrastructure that's required since they do own the cars of building out the depots and the charging and managing all of the fleets. Um, so that is kind of an additional orthogonal aspect to all of them. And so do you view, so I, I guess, so let me ask a two part question. Uh, number one, sort of what are your, what are some of the skepticisms you have about Tesla's approach? And then number yeah. two, is it fair to say that in a future state, uh, like an Uber S company, or maybe it's Uber. I don't know. Does it become yeah. more of a fleet management platform than a rideshare mm -hmm. platform? Is that how they transform? I I'd love to pick your brain on those two things. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, let's start with maybe the skepticism around, you know, what it would take. So I, I sort of honestly, like one of the reasons I was excited to chat with you, because I figured you would ask me about this and I kind of want to, you know, I haven't like done a lot of interviews or writing just yet about it. So I'm sort of like still, you know, kind of formulating, but like when people come to me and they want to start a new rideshare company, which has probably happened 300 times over the past 10 years, um, some more, you know, often not very well funded. I mean, the, the biggest thing is like, it's expensive. Um, and it's very difficult, like to start a ride share company. Right. Um, and then logistically, like what you need would be, you know, kind of a rider app and a driver app. I think that is pretty doable for Tesla. You also need insurance and uh, licensing. So licensing, pretty straightforward. I think you just tweeted or shared something about uh, maybe one of your videos you were talking about, like the Texas rules um, for Tesla, you know, that it kind of like could open up statewide. And actually a lot of like in California, the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission also is the one that regulates at a state level. So I actually like applying to be, you know, whether it's a TNC, which is Uber 
and Lyft, a transportation network company. Waymo actually has TCP in California, which is like a transportation charter party or something like that. So it's sort of more of like an Uber black car designation. So you need a license with the state and then you need commercial insurance. Um, so really like the licensing it, you know, there's some moving parts, but like it's doable. It actually, the insurance I think is the big interesting thing. Cause like, I don't think people realize like if you're not in the, sh like if you're in the shared fleet business, like insurance isn't your number one headache, whether you're sharing cars, you know, on Turo or whatever, or you're renting cars or your Uber themselves. Uber just has been talking a lot. Like if you've taken an Uber in Los Angeles, for example, as a customer recently, they actually are showing now on the passenger receipt and they're kind of like bitching that like, Hey, 40% of what you're paying now is actually going to insurance costs in California, right? So it's like, and Texas is actually very high too, for some reason. So it's like, you know, they get sued all the time. Drivers honestly drive kind of crazy. <laughs> you know, they're like in a rush. They're not making as much money as they used to. You know, they really are incentivized kind of indirectly, like the faster they go, the more trips they can do per hour, the more money they can make. And their pay has gone down over the past few years because there's more supply of drivers. So you have a lot of kind of incentives basically, you know, leading to this higher insurance cost. So like right now, 40% of what you pay on a hundred dollar ride, $40 is going straight to the insurance companies, like kind of a waste. Right. And so you could imagine that like in a robo taxi network, Waymo has released a ton of data and stats already that like they're getting in 90% fewer accidents. So I actually, you know, think insurance for, you know, like a good robo taxi network will actually be, they might still get sued, you know, occasionally, and there's some liability issues, but I actually think insurance could go down. So that could be another, you mentioned like the big cost savings is taking out the driver. The other big so cost savings could be the insurance, right? And so I think on the Tesla side, like the big thing I'm watching with this robo taxi launch, because, you know, it's sort of like, like I personally wouldn't get into the back of like a Tesla, well, at least my Tesla. Like, you know, I, I feel like there's some difference you could probably explain to me, like between the hardware and the software, but like my Tesla, you know, like I, I wouldn't sit in the back of it like I would in a Waymo. Um, but if like, that's why I'm watching and, and, you know, but other people I think gladly would. Right. And so it's sort of subjective, right? Like what's a robo, like, how do we know Tesla is ready for a robo taxi network? Like some people are going to do it. Some aren't. But one thing that I think isn't subjective that I'm watching is the insurance piece. Who's going to insure these vehicles. If Tesla goes out and is like, Hey, I'm like right now when they're like, Hey, it's FSD beta, you're on your own. I'm like, Oh, great. I hit a curb on Mulholland drive here, you know, on FSD and it was my fault. Right. I had to pay to get it fixed. Not a big deal, but cost me a few hundred bucks. Right. But if I smash into another if my robo taxi smashes into another car and kills some 19 year old you know teenager that has like million that's like a you know i don't even know what they call that it's like a mega insurance you know kind of liability right like i want tesla on the hook for that like i don't want to be on the hook for that or tesla's insurer so that's the big thing to me like that's kind of what i'm looking at like who's going to have the insurance liability because that is really the big thing when yeah. it comes to robo taxis